Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to another week. Starting off this week again, numbers. And we're back to the story of Balaam. Remember, I told you that we're going to be spending well, basically numbers chapters 22, 23 through 25. I'm talking about this, this prophet named Balaam, but he was not a prophet uh, that we can tell, at least, that was of uh, was sent by God. There was more, there was, uh, but here God seems to use him, uh, at least in the beginning. So uh, we're continuing with that. And we're going to talk today about the first and second oracles or prophecies. That Balaam is going to uh, tell Balak and how, and these are given to Balaam by God, these oracles. So let's get started and then let's pray. Oh dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, so much for this word and uh, for helping me to understand uh, your word. Continue to help us to understand your word and to be able to uh, glean something for it that uh, will help us understand you better and understand ourselves and uh, our world around us. And give us all your praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go. Oh. Now, as we continue our study of Balaam, we head into the high places where those of those, this area used for Baal worship. This becomes a major stumbling block, I think, as a, as a nation of Israel, right now we're in 1450 BC. We realize that once we get through the period of David and uh, Solomon, which is right around 1000 AD, uh, BC, uh, so it's still, that's still a better part of 400 years in the future. Then we get into the uh, 600 BC time frame. That the uh, this another major uh, situation happens, uh, and I see these as uh, attempts by Satan to try to stop the birth of Jesus. So I believe that uh, this whole thing could be looked at that way also. Is that uh, Balak is asking for a curse on the people. But now Israel is in a good graces though with God. And this story is more about how God can use pagan people for his glory. Here God is actually speaking for Israel, not to Israel. That's the other thing to kind of think about is when you're thinking about this, Israel, you know, Moses and, and, and that whole group of people is not even involved in this conversation. We're going to be happening, has happening in these, these chapters. This is between God, Balaam and Balak. Uh, and, uh, and so God is actually representing uh, Israel. And we can almost think of this as the same way Jesus Christ represents us as the uh, as Satan keeps trying to attack us. He is standing up for us. And you can almost see this symbolically the same way that God uh, uh, at this time is standing up for Israel against people that want to uh, harm them. But in chapter 25, we'll see that based on the last advice of Balaam causes the men to commit adultery, idolatry. So even though Balaam follows God's advice and only says what God tells him, somehow Balak accomplishes the death of 24,000 men. Due, due to this, we read in Numbers 31, 16. Let me get some verses up here. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles. Oh, no, that's Hebrews. Let's try this one. Behold, these, ca these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. We won't get to that today, but uh, Peor will actually talk about tomorrow. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Also in Deuteronomy 4.3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of ba Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. And Revelation 2.14. But I have found a few things against thee, because thou hast dared them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So here we get a hint, too, that... Uh, Balaam's actually the one that taught Balak how to uh, put a stumbling block in front of Israel. And James 4.4 4 kind of mentions something, too, along these lines. <laughs> Ye adulterers and adulteresses, 
Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Enmity makes, makes, basically means you at war with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's a little preview here of the uh, coming events. So at first it seems like Balaam is a kind of a great guy, uh, but uh, he's got his his whole uh, mindset is uh, to make money, and he's basically like a prophet for hire. He's been pretty successful at it because this this King Balak actually sent for him all the way uh, to Mesopotamia, and as we showed before, that's quite a ways away. Okay, so now onto our text today, Numbers twenty three. We'll take most of the chapter, but not all of it. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. Now, again, this sounds, it sounds very Jewish at first, but realize that as we look at this closely, uh, that uh, it, this isn't done under the pretense of what God is teaching the Israelites to do. This is done under some kind of pagan worship. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Notice there's seven altars, which uh, in the tabernacle there's only one altar. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by the burnt offering, and I will go pre-adventure. The Lord will come to meet me, and whosoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. So I'll stop here for a second. And... Uh, there was no biblical instruction, by the way, or precedent for what Balaam did. So presumably the sacrifices are part of a pagan ritual. Balaam was a man for hire and would do anything his client asked for. Yet God met with him and gave him a message which he was to repeat to Balak. As we, will, as we see in these passages, Balaam instructs Balak to erect seven altars. This was basically a sideshow for the client to look, to make it look almost like it's legit, like a religious. And God's letting Balak do it, Balaam do it, only because it, uh, uh, he's going to use this in a, in a way to, uh, uh, as an example. Like I said, many times God uses pagan people uh, to uh, accomplish his uh, mission. Okay, moving into verse 4. I'm going to put up a picture here. And uh, let's just uh, real quick uh, get an idea where we're at. Okay, Mount Nebo, this general area is where we're at, uh, is where uh, Balaam, I mean, and Balak are at. Right now, Shittim is where the uh, is where the Israelites are. So they're a little bit north of uh, the general area. I don't know for sure this 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 offering. The next offering is going to be definitely on a mountaintop, but but this one may have been also. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit too when we get here a little bit further. I have some nice pictures and uh, even a video. So I'll leave that there for now. And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and this thou, thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. But nothing about this was requested by God. That's another thing that he, uh, God did not tell them to do this, to, to do the offerings. So just a side shy, uh, I kind of look at this as a, uh, a sideshow of sorts. Notice Balaam always goes away from the altars to speak to God. High places are a place of solitude. Prior to the temple on Mount Moriah was built high places were used for both pagan and worship of God. But later they became a place God despised as they were used mostly for idol worship. As you see here, I just want to point to that uh, one, one example in 2 Kings 18, 3 through 6. <clears throat> and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, has, his father, had done. This is, uh, and he, he removed the high places and broke the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under these days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Neashiatan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after he was none like him among all the kings of Judea, 
nor any that were before him. For he cleaved to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. So basically in that passage, these high places I was just talking about were all destroyed by this uh, by one of the uh, sons of, uh, of David uh, when he was reigning. And, God's, and God looked on that as a great thing. So you can see that uh, even though there was times that uh, like uh, you'll see that Abraham and Moses and a few other people actually did set up altars. It was before the tabernacle was actually built and, and put into service, which we know is true now. And we're talking about here and that uh, once Mount Moriah, which is where the Temple Mount was in Jerusalem, once that's built, then the only, the only legitimate place to sacrifice will be there. So right now, it's okay to sacrifice both on these high places. But later on, it's going to be mostly just for pagan worship. So let's talk about these uh, high places for a minute. Now, let me get some... Uh, I'm going to show you this still first. Let me show you where this... This is Mount Nebo. This is standing on the edge of Mount Nebo, looking towards Jerusalem. As you can see by this sign here. Let me blow it up a little bit so you can see it. Uh, Jerusalem would be uh, basically following this line here in the Mount of Olives. So I'll give you an idea where to look. So basically off in this direction would be the Mount of Olives. We're quite a ways away, but... Uh, and right this minute, from here, I can't see it too well in this picture, but over basically in this general area is where, uh, where I believe that they are at. It's a mountain that's called Mount, uh, uh, I got it here, Pisgah. We'll talk about that here and we get to the second prophecy. But Pisgah, I believe, is over in this general area. I got a better picture than that. Let me just get one of these pictures. This one, this one shows uh, that one, this one. So again, Shittim is where they're at, where the, where the Israelites are at. And, and Mount Nebo is right here. You can see that Mount Nebo is uh, straight across. I, I'm trying to find a map I had. I know I got one. It shows that other mount. Just looking at it a few minutes ago. It's Mount Nebo again, and uh, Sarah Bit. Uh, it'd be about approximately there, but uh, it's not a good one either. No, I had one. Uh, is this one. Well, there it is. So you can see where Mount Nebo is, and off to the uh, to the. Uh, this would be uh, west, kind of like the northwest would be where this Mount Pisgah is. And it's right, it, it's basically a mountaintop that's right near where the, uh, where the encampment is. So the encampment is most likely right down below here. And so King Balak is going to take uh, Balaam up there in hopes that he's going to uh, curse the Israelites and he's going to show them to him from this Miss Pisgah, uh, Mount Pisgah. But I have this neat video from uh, Mount. I thought I'd show you. Let me actually bring it in full screen. You know, it's, it's only about 40 seconds. This is basically that uh, same direction we were just looking at in that map. So that uh, you can see over here, this is a much better picture. This general area over here, I believe, is where that Mount Pisgah is. It's over in here. This is a video somebody took. I won't play the whole thing because they actually show themselves at the end. Uh, right there. Uh, so I want to stop it here. So there is the Dead Sea over and behind there. I still want to go visit some of these places. So there's that. 
I think we were just talking about is the actual one from that mountain. But Jerusalem would be off in this direction. And so I would say that the Israelites, and the reason the king took them to this mountaintop over here is that I'm thinking they're over, they're basically over in this general area over here, down in the valley. And I think that's about it. Yeah. Leave that picture there for a couple of minutes of a, in a smaller version. And uh, we just leave it right there so you can kind of see what we're talking about. Now let me move it back a little bit. Most likely that this would be the general area that uh, we're, we're talking about here, where I think they might be. And they're looking down into this general area over here. Okay, so back to Numbers 23, verse 7. And, and he took him up and he told, uh, he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. So this is again Balak talking to uh, uh, Balaam. In the prophecies of Balaam, God testifies on both of behalf of his people rather than as usual to them. It is the divine testimony to their standing as a redeemed people in view of the serpent lifted up and of the water from the smitten rock. So these are two examples of, uh, of examples when the people were taught who God is and they, and they really, uh, and now they, and now they are in God's graces. So kind of think of it in this way, God is actually defending them uh, in front of this Balak. If you remember from last week too, we were talking about the fact that uh, Balak didn't even have to worry about this because God had already told Moses and he's going to tell Aaron the same thing is that leave the Moabites alone. Uh, you don't even don't even attack them. So there was no reason for Balak for even doing this. So in Numbers 21, verse 5 through 9 is when we remember that uh, that example. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loaneth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a certain had bit any man when he looked when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So that was that example. Then there was the other example about smiting the rock. And this is where Moses got in a little bit of trouble. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. So those, based on those two examples is when the people really fully understood that God is on their side. So their state was morally bad, but this was a matter concerning the discipline of God, not his judgment. So the interpretation of the prophecies is literal as to Israel and typical as to Christians. So through Christ lifted up, and so that, you know, that serpent, that whole serpent deal was, uh, was told to us in John 3, 14, what it meant. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So it's representing the fact that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross for us. So our standing is eternally secure and perfect, though our state may require the Father's discipline. So you can see a pattern here in what God is actually doing. He's protecting the people. He may judge them, and, and uh, not judge them, but, but punish them to make them uh, better, just like he'll punish us to uh, make us better. But that's different than judgment. 
So the same thing is happening to us, and uh, and we get disciplined when we go awry, even though we, we are fully saved. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 through 32. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, this is this is uh, this is the uh, discipline. For if we, we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So in other words, the, the, the father is being a father just like a, 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 an earthly father would be to his children. 2 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9 also. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. But the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Although sometimes God puts us through trials so that we can help others with the same trials. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for our consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering, which also suffer, or whether we be comforted. It is for our consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above, above strength and smuts that we despised even our life. So it's a trial that, that, uh, that Paul went through. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. That's basically death to self. And also in verses uh, 10 through 13, we deliver us from so great a death and doth deliver, and whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us, by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. <clears throat> but we write none other things unto you that what you read or acknowledge. And I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. <laughs> So meantime, against all enemies, God is for us. And that's what God is doing here for them. So it's a great pattern to show about us. Romans 8.31 speaks to this. What shall we say then to these things? If God be with us, be for us, who can be against us? But this, this whole story is kind of showing us. Okay, so back to Numbers 23. Read uh, verse 7 through 10. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defiled? This is Balaam explaining to Balak that he can't do what he's asking because God is not, uh, is not cursing them. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. <clears throat> Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let me last end be like his. <clears throat> so each of the four oracles concerning Israel takes up one of the promises of the Ar Aramaic, uh, Aramaic uh, covenant and confirmed it. This first one here, the first oracle, stressing that God has not cursed Israel, confirms that Israel will be like the dust of the earth. To this point, uh, God is not cursing Israel, so that he's not, he's not going to allow anyone else to either. <clears throat> Verse 11 through 12. So, and Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I... I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? So Balak, even though not a follower of God, respects him at least to the, 
to repeat what God wants him to. We see that God has used pagan men all through the Bible to get his word out. Some that may come to mind in, uh, is like the, the Pharaoh and Joseph in Egypt, and, uh, and also Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, plus many more. So even though in the end, Balaam does cause issues between Moab and God's chosen, in the end, it may be to refine the nation of Israel in preparation of the promised land. Okay, now for the second one. And this is the verses 13 through 26. We're getting started here in verse 13. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place, from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and, and shalt not see them all, and curse me them for, from thence. So basically, Balak is going to take them up to that mountain that I told you about, and I think it's over here. Again, we can bring up the map, too. And uh, But he's going to take them up Mount Pisgah, uh, Pisgah up here. And uh, that picture I'm showing you was standing on Mount, Mor uh, Mount Nebo, so you got to get an idea the direction. I'll put that one back up. So it's probably over here, because like I said, uh, Jerusalem is straight across from here. So to go uh, northwest, it'd be like over in this general area. Okay. Just a little, uh, a little understanding here. The correct designation for the mount is not Nebo, which has become usual for convenience sake, but the mountain adjoining Nebo is what Pisgah means. So a ridge of the uh, Abraham Mountains west from Hezbon, the uniform peakness natural of Pisgah causes its parts to be distinguished only by the names of the adjacent villages. So these mountains ain't really that high, so they typically... Uh, they've, they've used the term Nebo because there was actually a town named Nebo nearby. Uh -uh. So from Pisgah, Israel gained their first view of the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley. Hence, Moses, too, viewed the land of promise. Nebo was a town or, on or near that ridge, lying on its western slope. We see examples of this in Numbers 21.20. And from Bamoth in the valley, that is the country of Moab, to the top of Pisgah, which looketh toward Jezumon. Also in God, Numbers 32, 2 through 5. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest, unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Eloroth and Dibon and Jazar and Nimrah and Heshavon and Eli and Shibam and Nebo and Beon. So these are all towns. So I just wanted to point out that one of the towns is Nebo. Uh, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. So this land is also relatively flat. Because it, uh, uh, the, one of the tribes that had cattle, uh, Manasseh, uh, wanted that area because it was so flat. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for possession, and bring us not over Jordan. And some other references in verse 38. And Nebo and uh, baal Meon, their names being changed, and, and Shabai, and gave, and gave other names unto the cities which they built. So again, and referencing these as being cities. <clears throat> Also in Deuteronomy 32, 49. Get thee up into this mountain, Abram, unto Mount Nebo, which is, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. So way back in uh, Abraham, even before he, he got the ham part, Abram, God brought him up on this mountain to show him the land that he was going to give him. And then also Deuteronomy 34, 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah. So you can see how they associate Nebo with Pisgah. This is over against Jericho, and the, and the Lord show, 
showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. And also in scripture, Nebo denotes only the town. And we see that also in Isaiah 15, 2. He has gone up to Bejath and to Dibion in the high places to weep. Moab shall howl over Nebo and over Mediba, and all the heads shall be baldless and every beard cut off. And also Jeremiah 48, 1. Against Moab, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Woe unto Nebo, for it is spoiled. Kirtharam is confounded and taken. Misgab is confounded and dismayed. And jump into verses 21 through 24. And judgment has come upon the plain country, upon Halon, and upon Jehazerah, and upon Mephath, and upon Dibion, and upon Nebo, and upon Bethadithabayim, and upon Kirthathim, and upon Bethkamil, and upon Bethmiel. Meon, and upon Kiroth, and upon Basra, and upon all the cities of the land of Moab, far or near. So it identifies it in that passage, all those different towns, and Nebo was one of them as cities. So that's the only reason I put those in there. Okay, so back to the scripture we're studying. They brought him into the field of Zophin, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by the burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. So here he goes. He leaves the burnt offering and goes over to where the Lord, uh, to meet with the Lord. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say this. And when he came to him, boldly he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him, and Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Ziphar. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of a man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, he hath it, uh, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Let me stop here for a second. Balaam then said that because of the exodus out of Egypt, we saw that in verses 24, 8, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, he hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nation, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He mentions unicorn here. Israel had supernatural prosperity, no misfortune or misery, according to 20, verses 23, 21a. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. So the Lord's presence, and we see in 21b, the Lord has got, has God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. And the supernatural power, we see in verse 22, B, he hath as it were the strength of a unicorn. So the shout of the king must be understood as a materialistic threat, implying that the Lord is a warrior who leads his host to victory. So all the verses on this in Joshua 6 5. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. This is when they start to take Jericho, and, uh, what the, and how the walls are going to fall down. So it's going to, talking about hit, uh, victory here. Also in verse 20, So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, 
and people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Also Psalms 47.5, speaking about being a warrior. And God has gone up with a shout, the Lord will sound the trumpet. Jeremiah 4.19. My bowels, my bowels, I have pained in my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of, the, alarm of war. And one more, Jeremiah 49, 2. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will cause an alarm of war to be heard in Ribah of the Amorites. And there shall be a desolate heap, and her daughters shall be burned with fire. Then shall Israel be heir unto them that were his heirs, saith the Lord. If such power renders sorcery and divination harmless. So in other words, basically what we're saying here is that uh, God has given them power over, uh, over their enemies. And so that... Uh, Cursing them wouldn't do any good. So such power renders sorcery and divination harmless. Uh -uh. So I just mentioned too this this idea of the unicorn. Number one, the unicorn there is no such thing. Uh, there were if there were any, they were extinct uh, way before this period of time. So it's probably the wild bison, buffalo, ox, or urus, not only found in Lithuania. But they spread over northern temperate climates, like Bashan, etc. And the and a Hercynian forest, it was described by Caesar as almost the size of an elephant, fierce, sparing neither man nor beast. Stands in contrast to the tame ox used in plowing, like we see in Deuteronomy 33:17. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall perish the people together to the ends of the earth. And they, and they are the 10,000 of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So his Joseph horns are like the horns of a unicorn, the 10,000s of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Two tribes sprung from the one, from the one Joseph, are the two horns from one head. Therefore, the uh, unicorn was not as it represented as a one-horned animal, but some, some species of uh, urus or wild ox. So, to finish up here, let's just do a quick little review here. So, talking about the unicorn, or uh, this particular type of unicorn, it has great strength. That's mentioned in Job 39, 10, 11. Could I still bind the unicorn with his band in flurry, or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Will thou trust him, because his strength is great, or will thou leave thy labor to him? Makes like this sounds like a big animal, not not this small, uh, kind of like a deer looking kind of a thing. Had two horns according to Deuteronomy thirty three seventeen, which we just read. And he was also fierce, based on Psalm twenty two twenty one. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Untamable, according to Job thirty nine. 9 through 11. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Can I stop buying the unicorn with a band in his fury? Or has he hallowed the uh, valleys after thee? Will thou trust, trust him because his strength is great? Or will thou leave thy labor to him? Okay, so it's also playfulness of its youth. And that's in Psalm 29, 6. He made them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Sirlon like a young unicorn. And they're associated with bullocks and bulls for sacrifice. Isaiah 34, 6 and 7. The soul of the Lord is filled with blood, is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has sacrificed in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorns shall come down from them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, 
and they and the uh, they're dust made fat with fatness. Okay. And also verse uh, lifting up the horn in Psalms ninety two ten. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Basically representing the day. Uh, kind of have a stuck up, uh, I'm kind of stuck up, kind of proud, too proud. That's in retrospect to the fact that they, uh, most other bovine animals like this, uh, lower the head and toss up the horn. <clears throat> okay, finishing up this. Verse 23, so surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any deviation against Israel. Accordingly to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? I thought there's a, uh, Chuck Missler had this little, uh, this little history lesson in, the, in his commentary on it. I thought it was kind of cool. I'm thinking about the fact that our country started out uh, really God-fearing. And uh, to think uh, that uh, men we think of being kind of secular were actually quite uh, uh, followers of Jesus Christ. So we have an example here. In 1843, the U.S. Congress appropriated $30,000, and back then that was a lot of money, for Samuel B. Morris to construct an experimental telegraph line from Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. On May 24, 1844, Samuel Morris said, sent the first telegraph message. And what did, he, what did he send? He sent, what hath God wrought? In other words, he used this verse right here. What hath God wrought? He used that in his first message sent by telegraph. Okay, so I'm just finishing up this chapter. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor, the, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. He, counted, he couched, he laid down as a lion, and a great lion. Who, stir, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that bless thee, and curse he that curses thee. So that's the end of that chapter. And rather than being overcome, Israel is like a lion would arise and utterly destroy her enemies. That was that last verse I read, uh, Numbers 24-9, which we'll get into uh, next week, I mean tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll take on the third oracle, the prophecy of Peor. And that's, uh, if you want to read ahead, it's in Numbers 23-27, all the way through Numbers 24-25 which includes a prophecy of the Messianic kingdom. So that'd be fun to study. So that's what I have for today. And uh, have a great day and a great week. And talk to you again tomorrow.